nation of Israel, when God gave them all the commandments, when he gave them all the instructions, it wasn't that they could not do these things. It was they chose not to be obedient. There's the difference lies. We could study the book of Proverbs and even memorize all of these Proverbs, but if we don't apply them to our lives and make godly choices, we have no benefit other than understanding. We, we, wisdom, the completion of wisdom is that we do what we in, that what is the right thing to do. Okay, so chapters 1 through 9 give you that introduction to, to the wisdom and why we should embrace it. Um, chapter 1, verse 2, and it's a, it's a short one. It says, to know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding. And that's a, that's a, a thought in itself. To know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding. Remember I said the first nine chapters is explaining wisdom and how we're to apply it. So um, I, I looked this verse up under, um, I think in one of the commentators, I think it was Clark. And what he did, he took the three words, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. He, he pulled those three words out of that passage. This is uh, Proverbs 1 verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding. Okay, the wisdom. The way he defines these. Wisdom. The power by which human personality reaches its highest spiritual perfection by which all lower elements are brought into harmony with the highest. I know that's a lot, but listen to what he's saying. A wisdom, it's the power by which human personality reaches its highest spiritual perfection. So at that point of acquiring wisdom by which all lower elements are brought into harmony with the highest. So wisdom is, it's a two-part thing. It's, it's the human personality reaching its highest spiritual perfection, and the way it reaches that is by, by which all lower parts are brought into harmony with the highest. So understanding the wisdom and being at that level of understanding the wisdom is completed when we bring all of our other, el el or other elements of our lives up to that wisdom. He's kind of like, okay, I know what Proverbs tells me to do. Practices, like practices. Yeah, I have all of that. Now, when I bring my weakness in personality, my inability to follow directions, all the things that I would usually get into trouble with, when I bring those lower elements in my life up to that high peak of personal perfection, then I've I've accomplished that wisdom, so to speak. Does it make sense? You know, we can have all this head knowledge, and but we separate it from our practical application in our lives. We can quote all the right things to do, but if we don't do them, we do, if we don't bring those lower parts of our lives up to the level of what we know, then we've accomplished nothing. We're just a dictionary with all the words walking around, but the life doesn't reflect that. Okay, so that would be... That would be the wisdom that he bring that he um, he talks about in this verse two, and then he says the understanding of wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding. So let's see what he says about understanding: the power of distinguishing right from wrong, truth from its counterfeit. Did I miss it? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped instruction. <laughs> okay, so if I, if you can you can don't have to put them in this particular order, but instruction. Instruction is more in this case. It's more than just someone telling you what to do. You know, you you get a book with a um, something you're building, and it has the instructions on how to build it. They're good to have, but if you don't follow them, there's no advantage to you. 
So in instruction, in this sense, when, when the proverb says that um, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding. So the instruction is discipline or training, the practical complement of the wisdom. So knowing the wisdom, having that instruction, it is complemented when we, um, when we practice what we know. You know, you to say practice what you preach, but here he's saying this instruction is more than just understanding, it's doing. So in this one proverb so far, to know wisdom, the right thing to do, and instruction, discipline yourself to do this thing, Understanding, the final one, is the power of distinguishing right from wrong, truth from counterfeit. So in this one little verse, um, to know wisdom and instruction, discern the sayings of understanding. So we know what we should do. We put into practice through discipline and work in our lives. And then we are able to distinguish the right wisdom from the wrong wisdom, and to do that. Wisdom is a choice. I, I like this definition. Wisdom is a choice. The knowing is complete only in the doing. Wisdom is a choice. The knowing is complete only in the doing. So someone can be as wise and know everything, but the completion of knowing that wisdom is when you do it. Okay, any thoughts or questions on this? Giving you too much? think when, when you get a chance and you, you sit back down and you start reading through some of the Proverbs and maybe even have your little cheat sheet beside you and then you start to recognize some things and, and don't make this complicated. You know, it, it sounds very complicated um, like the parallelism. Knowing that it's just two lines. One says one thing, the other one says something either complements that or contrasts it or adds to it. That's basically the three um, parallelisms that were in that. So in in wisdom, when we talk about wisdom, we're saying it's wisdom is instruction, doing it, and understanding, doing the right thing, choosing which is right to do. And here's a... Uh, passage I want us to look at briefly. It's um, chapter 9, verse 10. And we've all heard this many times. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And um, the fear... You can put reverence. The fear, when, when you hear him say the fear of the Lord, that means the reverence towards him, how we, we recognize him. Um, I, I, but in also, in a sense, we should be a little fearful of this God of the universe who made everything, who loves us. But we also know that he chastens those that he loves. So we need to have that fear and that reverence of him, not some flippant attitude about, you know, and, and we can get down that road real easy uh, with some things. Um, without a reverence of the Lord, there will not be the urgency to do the right thing. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If, if you don't have a fear or reverence of the Lord, what is going to push you to do the right thing? If you think there's no repercussions for your actions, 
And you know, when we were all, when we were younger, we did things because it seemed like a fun thing to do. We didn't stop and think what the possible consequences, how we could get hurt or, I know my brother and I, we belong to, um, <laughs> almost embarrassed to say it, but a bunch of the guys in the neighborhood, we had a, what we called a daredevil club. <laughs> and in this daredevil club, we would say, I'm gonna go climb that tree and I'm gonna go from that limb on that tree to that limb on that other tree. And if I do it, I dare you to do it. That's kind of what it was. You had to do it before you could dare the other person to do it. So it was kind of like, okay, you do it, and then if you can do it, then I can do it. And that's what it was. And we did some crazy things. You know, going from one tree to another tree by crossing the limbs. Uh, there was other things I won't mention what they were, but we did some crazy things. But we didn't think about the consequences. We didn't think we'd fall and break a leg or I mean, if we did, eh, no big deal. You know, it was kind of it. So the fear of the Lord, the reverence of him, is the beginning of wisdom. Because without this, we will never do the right thing. It would be just so easy to slough it off. Oh, I tried. I'm not good enough to do that. Um, but if we have this healthy fear and reverence of our Lord, we want to do what's right. Okay. We can get the wisdom stuff finished tonight. Okay, if you have your second um, handout, wisdom, the wisdom books also has parallelisms. And pretty much the definitions are the same. I, I just brought it in here after the, the prophetic, prophetic uh, poet things, you know, their, their parallelisms. So in the wisdom literatures, there's the same parallelisms as in some of the prophet's poetic forms. Um, and there's three different ones, just like um, the ones we saw before. The only difference is I have some different examples from Proverbs. Um, don't look at your paper. Put your paper down. Let me ask you a question, pop quiz, so to speak. The first one is synonymous repetitious parallelism. Anybody want to tackle that, what it is? Repeating, uh, repeating the same thing, but in a second line. In a different word, yeah. In the second line, saying the same thing that the first line says. Okay, how about the um, antithetical, the contrastive parallelisms? Anybody want to do that one? Jamie? I don't know how to explain it. Well, it would be contrast, so it would be the opposite. It would be like uh, saying the same thing, but with different. Example. Different. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. It, it can be in a different sentence, but it's, it's bringing the same thing. It may be even um, adding to that first one, but by saying it in a little different way. In other words, this is what I mean. Yeah. It's a contrast to it. And then the last one, see, we only have one person left to do this one. Um, synthetic, the completative parallelism. You want to tackle that one? No, no, don't do that because I'm dyslexic too. Okay, completative. It completes something. It's just like um, like um, and like an explain, like you said, it's like a complete completion of the whole explanation. Yeah. Bring it back. Bring make it whole. Yeah. He says something and then he completes that thought with the second line. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the um, the ones I have here. Um, or you have them, so we don't, you don't need to take notes. And it's kind of fun not to have to take notes. Um, now this, this one, I have a little different definitions for them on the um, proverb, the wisdom part. It doesn't, it's not meaning anything different. It just, uh, one section that I looked at after I had the other ones written down, I found it had a little more uh, emphasis on it. So a synonymous or the repetitious parallelism. This is a feature where the second line repeats the thought of the first line, but in different words. Um, the repetition intensifies the thoughts and feelings being expressed. Um, the short is, the second line repeats or reinforces the first. So that's that repetitious uh, aspect. An example is the Proverb 19.5, a false witness will not go unpunished, and the second part of the line, the parallel part of it is, he who speak lies will not escape. So it's saying 
the same thing, only a little bit differently. The first one says a false witness will not go unpunished. And then the, the second one, you can change it and say liars are not going to get away with it. Mm -hmm. He who speaks lies will not escape. And the whole, the whole concept in, in why God chose to reveal these wisdoms this way was to reinforce it to us. If he just used the first line, a false witness won't go unpunished. Who could buzz on by that? But then you read the second one, he who speaks lies will not escape. He's gone from a witness, usually would be, you know, we think of a witness in court. What did you see on that particular night? Did you see the defendant chasing that person with a hammer or whatever it would be? Um, so we've got that concept in our mind. Then he reinforces that or he drives it home, so to speak. He who speaks lies will not escape. So now it's almost personal. Before, it's a witness who's not telling the, the right story. Now he's saying, how about you? Uh, if you speak lies, you're not going to get away with it. So it goes from a witness to someone who's lying. Okay? And then the uh, contrastive, antithetical parallelism. In this feature, the second line is the opposite of the first. In the book of Proverbs, this type of construction is the most common of the different types. The second line contrasts the thought of the first, reinforced, reinforcing the first by the contrast. Um, and again, this is, to me, it's like I say something and I say, in other words, or maybe I'll give you another example, but I'm, I'm presenting the same thing. Different way of saying it, yeah. And I know personally, I've been with people, and I will, will say something, and they want to correct you, and they say the same thing, only a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no, that really means this. Well, you know, what you just said was the same thing I said, just said it differently. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this contrastive, uh, chapter 19, verse 16, he said, He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his ways will die. There's the contrast. Um, he's saying, you do right, you keep your soul. You do wrong, you lose your soul. So the contrast, but it's, it's the same thought. Either do the right thing or not. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, I think I have two for that. The second one is chapter 1, verse 7. Um, did I get my pages out of order? No. Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we're, we're kind of back to that. Uh, verse um, 1916, it's, it's the same, starts the same, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, now it says the beginning of knowledge, earlier it said the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the first line is saying, fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge. Reverence and fear to her, towards him will bring about knowledge and understanding. The fool despises wisdom and instruction. You know, there, there are people that no matter what you say to them, how convincing you present an argument to them, they're not going to hear it. They say, you know, what's the expression? I might as well talk to that wall. I'll get about as good a response. Okay, and then the last one is the synthetic or completative parallelism. Uh, in this poetic style, the second line advances the thought of the first. Each line is synonymous but each additional line adds to the thought of the first, making it more specific. The second line adds to the first in a manner that provides further information. Uh, and the example is, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is overlooked. His glory is to overlook a transgression. Um, yeah, the, the second line, his glory is to overlook a transgression. I think of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love does or never notices a wrong suffered. So, you know, he's saying that there, but the first line he's saying, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger. Having a controlled spirit and an understanding uh, will allow you to be slow to anger. You have the ability to um, discern what's going on in your head, so to speak, and you're able to respond slower, and that will um, 
reduce the opportunity for anger to come. Um, there's, there's a part of our brain, and we're not doing anatomy tonight, but there is a part of your brain that's called the limbic system. Anybody familiar with that? It's the center of your brain. It's called the limbic system, and what it does, it controls fight or flight. It's the part of your brain that every sense that you have, smell, feel, uh, hear, fear, whatever it is, it goes to that part of your brain first. If, I, if that's hot and I touch it, that part of my brain says, move your hand, fight or flight. How to react. It's, it's a system that tells you you're in danger. Here's what you need to do. Now, the disadvantage, I mean, it's hardwired. You can, it just, it's there, and it's there for your protection. But the problem comes in when we let that thought process stay there. Then we do fight. Mm -hmm. The flight sometimes is good. We're in a dangerous situation. We feel that sensation. We see something. We see a big cloud coming before us. It's time to run or hide or do something. But if someone comes at you verbally and you let that thought process stay in that center part of your brain, then you're going to react with fight. And when you do that, if you don't get a control, then you become angry, then you become outraged, and then you become uh, uncontrollable. And you've seen people, a little thing will set them off, and they, and they just keep going down that road until you can't even talk to them. The best thing you can do is just get as far away from them as you can and let them settle down. Now, the, the brain, what we want it to do, and we can train ourselves, when we get that limbic system notification, one, two, three, four, five, count to 10, that's not a fallacy. That allows that thought process to move to the front of your brain where your rational thought is. And that's this whole thing about wisdom. <laughs> yeah, that's this whole thing about wisdom. You take the thoughts and in Corinthians, it's, I think it says, take every, is it Corinthians? Take every thought captive. God's instructing us, don't let, don't let this limbic system, it's there for a purpose, to protect you, but you can't let that be the thing that controls your life. And I, I know people, they pretty much operate out of that limbic system. Whatever comes their way, they, they either fight or flight. They never are able to move it to the point where they rational, you know, get some rationale to it. And I think with time and with training, and with the renewed mind and the transformed heart, we can be a totally different person. The things that used to trigger this so hot, now they come there and they just automatically move to the front and we say, okay, that's not something I need to get excited about. Or we don't even think that. We just, it's part of the spirit within us controlling us and not the flesh outside of us controlling us. The other thing I would uh, encourage you to do, and I, I have it on the notes here, look at your book, the one that you're all reading right now, <laughs> Introduction, Introducing the Old Testament Books. You can go to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and it will tell you all the different authors in Proverbs, because it wasn't just Solomon. There was others that wrote in there, and it will give you an outline of how the Proverbs are, how they break down. It's, it's, it's interesting. So... Um, Take a look at that to give you a little uh, completion on the Proverbs idea. And I, I'm hoping to come back to give you some more stuff on the wisdom literatures. I'm trying to get through um, the literature side that we talked about. The next one that we want to talk about, which will be next week, I'm going to do some on the Psalms. Uh, some don't see it so much as a literature category, but I think there's some interesting things that we can pull from the Psalms. Uh, the nation of Israel, they pretty much operated on those Psalms. You ever read some of the Psalms? It'll say a Psalm of Ascent or a Psalm of Descent. When it's a Psalm of Ascent, if they're going to Jerusalem for a feast or a festival, this Psalm is something they read or sing or say as they go up the mountain to Jerusalem, ascent. That's why when you read the read scriptures, it always says, go up to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem was up on a mountain. There was no way to get to Jerusalem other than by going up. 
even if you were north of Jerusalem, heading south, we always think you come down, but you still would have to go up. So psalms that say a psalm of ascent would be psalms that they sing as they're going up to Jerusalem on the mountain. And in psalms that say a psalm of descent would be when they were leaving Jerusalem coming down from the mountain. So that's just, you know, the distinction between those two. And often when you read, you'll say, and as he was coming down from Jerusalem, but sometimes he's going north, but he's coming down the mountain. So it gives you a little topography reference to understand why they're always saying up and down to Jerusalem. Doesn't anybody go sideways to Jerusalem? You know, <laughs> just go across the street. No, you have to go up. Everything is up. Okay? Any thoughts or questions? We're past our time, but that's okay.